I know you all know Nichelle Nichols as Uhuru from Star Trek, uh, but did you know that she had a primary role in NASA? This is a crazy story. Let's let's investigate. <laughs> Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore. I am pleased to talk to you today about a documentary called Woman in Motion, Nichelle Nichols, Star Trek and the Remaking of NASA. It's a long title, uh, but I'm excited to talk to the director today, Todd Thompson, who is here with us to discuss the film. Todd, welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, Chris. Great to see you. Um, I, I got to say, I know a lot about Star Trek. I know about Uhura. Um, I'm uh, excited that in your documentary, you point out that Uhuru is a Swahili word meaning freedom, which is the origin of the Uhura name. But I did not know anything about her role in NASA in diversifying the astronauts that went into space via the space shuttle and the space program. Um, unbelievable story. And the amazing amount of archival footage that you were able to dig up on this is remarkable. I mean, I, I've known Nichelle Nichols from going to Star Trek Vegas um, and those events and seeing her interviewed. Um, it's just amazing. And this, this documentary, not only have you told her story, you have so many incredible interviews um, with, with people in this documentary, uh, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, astronauts, Clearly, this is something, a labor of love that you worked on for years. What is the origin of the story of the making of this film? Well, Chris, I, I got to take like a half step back because like I'm actually a Star Wars guy, believe it or not. I'll, I'll fully admit that live on on, uh, on the show here. But, um, you know, of course, I grew up with Star Trek. Star Trek to me was always this black and white show that was, uh, you know, playing on the little TV set. Uh, in our kitchen when my dad was making TV dinners, my mom was volunteering at bingo night, Saturday nights, and we watched Star Trek on this little black and white TV. So I grew up with Star Trek, but it didn't come into full color for me until the movie started coming out. And, you know, of course I knew, I knew Uhura and I knew all the characters in the show, but I had no idea how, what the role she played, if any role at all in the NASA program, in the space program. I mean, I had no clue. So you can imagine like when I got that phone call from my producing partners, how many years ago now, um, I, I was just blown away, but it, it took me like, you know, seconds to just get hooked and be like, yeah, this is definitely a story we got to tell. Well, it's, uh, it's incredible because she's so passionate about it. Effectively, NASA hired her as a, uh, as a spokesperson, um, to do publicity in a campaign to bring, to diversify the pool of talent uh, of astronauts. I mean, she was inspired by, of course, um, landing on Apollo 11, landing on the moon, as were all Americans at the time, but also like, hey, we're, you know, there's, we've had this whole program of astronauts and there are no people of color, no women involved in this program. Now, of course, I mean, you, you, you look like now we just accept it. Like you've got the International Space Station and just everything is diverse, you know, not, not just uh, when it comes to various uh, ethnicities, but people from all over the world. But that was not, that was not the case early in the space program. Um, how did you go about getting all this archival footage? So, and some of the footage, I have to say, I'm so blown away. Um, that some of the footage, not only uh, she, you, you see her, um, you know, actually she wanted to know what it was like to be an astronaut. So she went through some of the training that the real astronauts go through and that you, you, you have found some footage of her in the Star Trek, the motion picture uniform that she had. I thought that was amazing, just as a Star Trek fan, and uh, I'm happy you admitted you're a Star Wars. I'm, I'm. You can be a Star Wars and a Star Trek fan. Of so, no, no, uh, I love everything space. <laughs> but how did you go about the archival research that you did? Was absolutely remarkable and stuff that I would have thought that I would have seen. I had never seen before. Well, um, yeah. First of all, I, we had a great team. I mean, uh, Tim Franta, Dave Teague, my two producing partners. Uh, Vince Skrull was our archivist producer. We, we had a producer specifically assigned just for archival material, archival content. You know, to your point. But yeah, you know, I mean, Nichelle back in the day, she she did she was very much inspired by the moon landing, like like pretty much everyone in the world was. But she was the one who was bold enough you know, pardon the pun to ask the question, where are my people? And um, I'm sure she spoke for, 
just millions and millions of people around the world of color and of different backgrounds, you know, you know, white guys landed on the moon and where are my people? So, I mean, space should be for everyone. And that is just something she was, she very much believed in and was very convicted to and um, dedicated a, a good, the, basically the rest of her life supporting and promoting her, her campaign with NASA was ironically extremely short, short lived, you know, it was, it was a, a short campaign uh, and what she accomplished during that short time was amazing. But the reason we have diversity in space now is because of Michelle, um, because of that simple question that she asked way back when. And you even went over the numbers, right? The number of applicants and then the, the I mean, the fact that you were able to dig up that data was, was pretty incredible. And she's still passionate until today. She's passionate about this. I mean, she really should be proud of this accomplishment. I've always been kind of a NASA geek. Um, I, I, I live in Pasadena, very close to, to JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, okay. where I have gone on the official tour and it's amazing. I recommend to anyone watching this or listening to this, um, if you can get on any of the NASA tours, it's incredible. I mean, they really open their doors and you get to see things like them assembling different space probes and you see them in this like hermetically sealed environment and they're all like, you know, they look like they've got PPE on, right? Like they're there and they're assembling. And what's interesting, I didn't know about this. Whenever they build something, they build two of them so that they have like, here's um, a space probe here on this side and there's another space probe here so that if there's any issue, they can see it. They, they make, you know, they make two of them. It's it's incredible. So get to, get to one of those tours. But um, Nichelle Nichols and just having seen her at conventions and whatnot, she really is, I think you say it in the documentary, she's a force of nature. She's not just, you know, someone who, um, I mean, obviously a remarkable actress, but what I think Gene Roddenberry saw in her was a person that was just passionate about um, her ideals. And she clearly was cast on Star Trek for more than just being a remarkable actress. And um, you, what, what you captured is kind of what she brought to the world. How did you secure, the interviews are amazing. I'm sorry, I'm gushing a little bit. Uh, I've been doing an interview and I'm gushing about Nichelle Nichols, but you know, I grew up watching Star Trek with my dad. It was a gateway to conversations about everything until today, you know, um, that's, it, it, it remains so. But how did you, how did you secure all these interviews? You've got everyone from, you know, I mean, really just uh, uh, amazing. Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think, did I see John Lewis in there? I think like, just like, yeah. uh, you clearly spent years to gather these interviews. How, wh what was that process like? Yeah, it, it, it took years. I mean, it took five years to be exact. And um, it, it was, a, it was a, you know, it was an extremely humbling process to just be in the company of a lot of these amazing people. I mean, in their own right, they, they all bring something amazing to the table with, with their own God-given talents. But, you know, it, it, you know, as far as securing the interviews, it, it wasn't really a hard sell with Michelle. She, you know, her she speaks for herself. I mean, she is just, as a person, just the epitome of like, Hollywood royalty and just a, a, a true, a, she's just such a, just a loving and giving person. Her energy just exudes as you, I mean, I'm sure you've met her and you know what I'm talking about. And so, you know, that, 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 that just flows into like how open and willing people are to, to talk about her and, and to share, you know, the excitement of her story. And um, it goes so much further beyond just her screen time on TV or on the big screen um, or even her performances on stage, you know, in Broadway and whatnot. So, you know, securing the interviews really, it, it, was a, it was a game of patience, you know, because there were so many that wanted to talk and so many we wanted to talk to because she touched that many people along the way. But um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't hard securing them. It just took time. Well, I think, I think maybe when you just ask people, hey, would you like to do an interview about Nichelle Nichols and, uh, you know, how she influenced I mean, what, what's also, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's great. like, also, I'd heard that story about MLK for years, but I'd never heard her tell that story that she was very frustrated with her role on Star Trek and that she was the, you know, hailing all frequencies, hailing frequencies, like she was so sick of that line, but mm. it was Martin Luther King, MLK, who, who, um, met with her and explained to her how important her presence on Star Trek was. You including that story and having her tell it in her words was just was just amazing. Um, I want to ask if there's, uh, you know, I mean, normally when you make a documentary, what, you need 100 hours of footage, 300 hours of footage, you get it down to 90 minutes or so. What, what did you have to cut out that really... <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a loaded question. I mean, the first cut was a god, 
oh, 110 minutes, I think. I mean, we had hours and hours and hours of footage. We, we interviewed over 60 people, only about 30 some ended up in the final cut of the film, if that gives you any indication. Um, but just, you know, we could probably cut another couple films based on everything we have. Um, but it was, you know, um, when you're making a movie, you got to, you got to kill your baby, so to speak. And you, you, you really just gotta, I, I always just approach it. I always try to keep a, you know, a fresh eye on it. And it's hard when you get so close to something, not just making the film all those years, but then, you know, sitting with the editor all those months when you cut. Um, but I, I, I keep a team of people around me that I, I keep them distanced, if you will, um, not socially distanced, but creatively distanced. So, you know, people are seeing the film at different stages at different times and nobody is too familiar with it. So I can really get, a clear objective criticism of, of what we've got going on in case I'm missing something. But uh, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it just really boiled down to, you know, what is the story we're trying to tell here and, and how far left or how far right do we want to go and how many rabbit holes do we want to go down, you know, before we get back on track. And so, you know, to get down to that 90 something minute runtime, it, it did take a lot of, uh, a lot of creative effort and, and courage just to say, you know what, we got to, save this one for the deleted scenes, which we do have. We have some deleted scenes that are pretty cool. Yeah, I was hoping I was gonna ask you about that. Um, yeah. This clearly um, is something that you need to get <clears throat> on DVD with deleted scenes. So I hope that's coming at some point when you can talk about I hope it. So it's, we got some good ones. Okay, good. Well, well, I do happen to know that the movie is opening February 2nd. It's in one of those Fathom events, which yeah. I'm a huge fan of those. So it's coming to theaters. I'm hoping drive-ins because there are um, most theaters are closed where I live, but drive-ins are open. So um, you can Google Fathom Events. You can go to woman-in-motion.com for ticket information. I assume at some point there'll be a VOD and DVD release, but but seeing this in the theater would be really amazing. I've been to some of those fa Fathom Events. Um, they are so fun. I actually went to one where they showed colorized versions of I Love Lucy. Mm -hmm, and yeah, yeah packed it was packed and people were dressed it seems like whenever i go to these fathom event things people are always dressed up people do cosplay it really is like a like one of the Rocky horror picture show right <laughs> yeah no it's it's super fun i love it so um check it out on on february 2nd and go to woman-in-motion.com for ticket information for the fathom events um i i have to ask you todd uh one of the things that i love and it's a real treat don't leave don't leave when the credits roll. There's a lot of fun yeah. stuff. Uh, don't leave when the credits roll. But I find it really interesting that almost everyone involved in Star Trek loves to sing. And <laughs> there's a great, uh, I don't want to spoil it too much, but there's a great, why do you think that is? This is my- Well, I, 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 got, a, I got a funny story for you. Um, Michelle was in Orlando with us um, a few years ago now, but um, my wife and kids and I, we, we went to breakfast with her at this local place down the street. And over the course of breakfast, you know, of course, she's talking about her singing career and we just had lots to talk about. But all of a sudden she said, you know, I I sang the theme song in Star Trek. I go, no way. Because I, I didn't know that. And um, so sure enough, in the middle of this noisy restaurant, she starts to belt out this, oh, you know, like a much better <laughs> kid. the entire restaurant went completely silent. And you could hear a fork drop in the kitchen and like everyone at the end just broke into applause. And it was like, it was such an amazing, like one time only event. You, you, you couldn't even, it, it happened so fast. You couldn't even take your camera out, you know, your phone out to take a picture or get a video of it. But it was, it was brilliant, but she's got an amazing voice. And she says it in the movie, she, she's able to, which, which I don't think many people can do this, but she can sing at different octaves. She can go really low and she can go super high. And, and of course, everywhere in the middle in between, but um, she, she's just, I mean, she's, She's talented on every angle. <laughs> every corner of her's got a little bit of talent. So well, I love, I love her. I love Star Trek. Um, uh, and uh, you know, just having watched every episode of the original series multiple times, she is clearly the person with the singing voice. Let me just say, I <laughs> there is. Uh, I, I I mean, everyone from Shatner to Nimoy and, and whatnot. So many other Brent Spiner. They all did like these. You know albums where they sang the only person turns out that can actually sing is michelle nichols and there's proof in your documentary so <laughs> yes 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 yeah the movie's not over till it's over so watch it to the bitter end awesome uh todd thompson thank you so much for talking to us woman in motion michelle nichols star trek and the remaking of nasa is coming to theaters as part of a fathom events uh get tickets see it um todd thank you so much for joining us on the film threat podcast it's really been a pleasure
All right, Chris, it's great to see you. And um, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. All right, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. 